our defensible space and wildfire basics uh, program. Before we get started, I wanna take a moment to welcome you, any of you who are new to the California Native Plant Society and tell you a little bit about our organization. California's native plants are special from the Joshua tree to the poppy fields to the redwoods. We live in one of the most botanically rich places on earth with more types of native plants than any other in the US. Um, CNPS is a nonprofit organization made up of more than 10,000 members and 35 local chapters, such as this one, the Riverside San Bernardino chapter. Together, we, we are working to conserve wildlands, protect endangered species, collect scientific data, and restore nature to our home and public landscapes, one garden at a time. None of us, insects, birds, nor humans can exist without plants. Saving plants, we save everything else, and saving plants saves habitat as well. If you're inspired by what you see and hear today, um, uh, become involved. Uh, become a member by uh, visiting cnps.org forward slash join, or sign up to receive our, our emails and learn more about what we're doing at cnps.org forward slash get connected. Um, yeah, our next program will be February 18th and at a, a hybrid and online and in-person meeting uh, at, at the RC, RCD, but also here on, on the internet. And, um, and that will be Scott Kleinrock of the Chino Valley Water District. And he will talk to us about how to successfully communicate with other people about native plants, because sometimes us native plant people can get a little too geeky for the room. Um, so uh, right now I'd like to introduce Katie Barrows, our tech host for today. Thanks, Orchid. Um, I'm going to just let you know, all know that we will have an opportunity for you to ask Becky questions at the end of her presentation. And if you would just please you put your questions in the Q&A, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should have a place where you can put Q&A. We'd prefer that you don't use the chat, but I will also patrol the chat for questions as well. Um, so you can do that, just put your questions there. Um, and I also want to mention, in addition to the program that, that excuse me, um, Orca just mentioned, we are going to have a field trip in the desert a wildflower field trip on March 11th, and you can check our Facebook page and uh, website for more information. We will we'll be sending out notices about programs to everybody who's on our email list. So thanks very much. Okay, so I I would uh, I would like to let people know uh, who who might be disturbed by chat pop-ups that you can. In your own Zoom settings, uh, turn off the chat notifications. And you can do that on mobile by clicking the bell uh, at the upper right of the chat notification. And um, you can do that uh, on the desktop by going into your settings. Uh, uh, and you can access your general settings either, either by clicking the up arrow to the right of the mute and stop video, uh, uh, I'm sorry, buttons, just a little mental bubble there. So I'm gonna introduce our speaker. Our speaker is Becky Levers. Um, she has, has uh, been an educator. Um, she has completed an, and completed an MS in environmental science. She is, uh, uh, completed the California naturalist training and she is, so she is a master naturalist and she is a Riverside um, master gardener. And she has been a, a member of our chapter since 2012. So welcome Betty, Becky. Okay, um, Missy, I would like to say just a couple of things before I start today. Um, and I want you to know that I am not been formally trained in bioscience. My husband and I bought a 
home in between Oak Glen and Cherry Valley when we moved back to Southern California in 2012. Shortly thereafter, we received a fire assessment from the state of California. I think it was $115 or $150 for fire protection. I had no idea we were living in a very high fire hazard zone. So I took a good look around and started to do research and I'm still doing it. So my email um, address will be in either the q and I think Q&A or chat, so that you can contact me with any feedback you have today, concerns, any questions, or just anything, okay? We're going to take a few minutes at the end of today's presentation to look at the resources page I made for you. Becky, you need to speak a little louder. I'm sorry oh, to break okay. in. I'll speak louder. Okay, I wonder if my volume is up. As, but anyway, okay, so I I do want to show you the resources page. It's not, it's short, it seems to me, but it gives you en enough the topics and websites I'm using today so that you can do your own research. If you don't have hard copies of those, just email me and I'll send them to you. Now I'm gonna share my screen so we can get started here and I hope this thing works properly. Okay, let's see here. I can't, I'm gonna get, whoops. We don't wanna look at all of this. Unfortunately, I can't click on, share my screen. I mean, the, how do I get rid of this? Becky, your okay. screen is showing. You just need to click on slideshow. And I then... know, but the the uh, bar across the top, mute, stop video, etc., is covering covering that up. So go down to the yeah. bottom. And there's a little picture of a slide. Uh, there's a little picture of a slide. It's um, right next to the volume control. A lot next to the volume control. A little. Um, Along the top? No, I don't see it. So you can't get. Let me go back a second and just. Yeah. Maybe I could do it before. Just move your. You can move your bar. Okay, I'm trying to. Oh, okay, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you can tell I'm really with it today. Oh my gosh. Okay. Hey, you got so it. There we are. Okay. Um, Wildfire in California is a complex and difficult issue. It's compounded by drought climate change, and the 30 million people that live in California, about 12% of the entire population of the United States, most fires are ignited by humans and human-related activities. Car trouble while driving along scenic highways, power lines sparking in high winds, garbage trucks dumping smoldering loads, and electrical short in a private residence, gender reveal parties. Campfires, SOS signals from lost hikers, sparking from small landscape equipment, and occasionally an arson, arsonist. We have to be part of the solution. This is every Californian's fight. Today, we're gonna to briefly discuss the most basic information we need, realizing that it's a moving target, whether we like it or not. So the topics today first, first we're gonna start with fire hazard severity zones and learning about these and understanding that there are several topographical and weather conditions that can make your hazard more extreme. And um, if you find that you live in a fire hazard zone, you have to first make your home as resistant to ignition as possible. Becky, so, you need yeah? to speak more loudly. Be okay. closer to your microphone. My microphone is built in. Okay, you know what? I wonder if I can, hmm. I wonder if it's turned up completely. Did we have this trouble before? Let me look, let me look. Okay, that's 100%. Okay. Oh, now I gotta go back. Uh, screen share. Let's start this again. Um, Okay, let me know if I sound better. I'm hoping I do. You do. 
Is that better? Okay, good. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so we're talking about what's called home hardening. To a wildfire, your home is just a huge pile of fuel, and it's much more fuel than the native plants that were bulldozed when it was built. So we're not going to talk about this, the specifics of this today, but we're going to look at a resource that will help you with this issue. But this is where you need to start. Next comes defensible space landscaping with fuel load and ignition prevention always in mind, using the best practice techniques to prevent fire from spreading to your home. The landscaping concerns are also organized in zones. And we're gonna to talk today about the first one. The first five feet from your home is called zone zero. This is the most important zone we all have this zone, whether we live on large or small properties. And this is where we can make immediate improvements to our homes to protect them from windblown embers, which are actually the main reason that most homes ignite. And finally, we have to accept the time that the time may come when we may have to evacuate. This, this map from Cal Fire website depicts a third and most hazardous level of fire risk, the very high fire hazard severity zone of Western Riverside County. Okay, all the areas that are colored pink or red, the red section is the local responsibility area, where this means that a local to fire apartment um, a county to fire department, a fire, um, sometimes our fire districts or a municipal a fire company is the, the primary responder, the first responder. The pink, which is mostly rural area, is really a combination of three areas. It's the area of the state responsibility area where Cal Fire is the primary responder. Also, it includes federal lands where the US Forest Service or um, the Bureau of Land Management uh, are the uh, primary responders and also reservation, reservation areas that are served by tribal fire agencies. This map is from 2007. Cal Fire released a 2022 update earlier this month for public comments, but it only applies to the unincorporated rural areas that are in the state responsibility area. Update of the local responsibility areas will come later. Overall, the 2002 maps do show increased fire hazard, reflecting California's increase in wildfire occurrence and severity. The state requires local agencies, that's in the red area here, to have robust fire policies in their very high fire hazard zones, but local agencies may tailor the, the specifics to meet local needs. And they may require more than the state does actually. Keep in mind that all fire agencies work and collaborate closely together, but this is definitely a work in progress. Now, Oh, here we go. Using the example from San Bernardino, San Bernardino County, this is the map of the very high fire hazard severity zone within the Redlands uh, city limits, where of course the primary responsibility is the Redlands Fire Department. This is a 2007 map, but eventually it, like other cities and towns, will be updated. I am using the 2007 viewer today as nothing has changed yet for those of you living in local responsibility areas. However, I've listed both the 2007 and the 2022 viewer in the resources page. By using this fire hazard severity zone viewer, you can pretty much determine if you live in a fire hazard area, if you're close to a state fire hazard severity zone, be sure to check the 2022 viewer too, as that's where you're gonna see um, the most recent changes. This is a close up uh, of uh, Western Riverside County. So you can see that the color coding is much more complicated than that of the first map we looked at. 
The very high fire hazard severity zone in the local responsibility area is still red, but the state responsibility is coded in three colors. Pink for the most dangerous area, that very high fire hazard. Tan, if you can see some tan color in here, that's high fire hazard. And pink is a moderate level. Uh, the green in here is mostly the federal responsibility area and probably the majority of it in the very high fire hazard zone or it's controlled by a, but that is controlled by the federal government or a tribal nation, not the state of California. To find your level of hazard, just click on the little binoculars here on the left side of the screen and then let's see if I can close this. And then this pop-up will show up on the right side of the screen with a address prompt. I typed in my address, then you hit this little binocular uh, icon here. And so here we have this circle right here is my home and the uh, very high fire hazard severity zone of the state where Cal Fire is the um, primary responder. But you can see that a lot of my neighbors are in, although they are still in a very high fire hazard area, they're in a local responsibility area. So it would be either Ukaipa, which would, is up here in San Bernardino County, or this would be Cala Mesa, most likely in Riverside County. Okay, um, although I live in a housing development, it is just a housing development, uh, it is surrounded, as you can see, by uh, the wild and what is called the wildland urban interface. This is where homes abut or intrude into wildland areas. It is probably the most common, common housing development style in Southern California today. Maybe 20% of all Californians live in the WUI. Most of us drive through it frequently though. We spend time in it and the lines that bring us electricity run through it. Okay, this is the 2007 map. Okay. This is the updated 2022 map. And you can see they first start with kind of a more of a close up of your house. Okay, and you can see They've changed a little bit here. The address prompt is on the right side of the screen. You just type in your address. Again, there's mine. You hit the binoculars. And you can see that I'm in something red here. But to actually see the, um, the legend, you have to click over here to get the legend. So you can see here that I am in the very high fire hazard zone in the state responsibility area still. Although some of my neighbors to the east have been downgraded to just the high. Pretty unusual in this map, but there it is. And also on this map, if you look kind of closely, you can actually see houses and streets. And you can see that across the street from me, this house abuts directly on the wildlands. I do not, at least I have that house and a big street that's protecting my home. Uh, the house over here abuts on the wildlands directly. So even inside a very high fire hazard zone, there are little nuances that can change um, your hazard actually. Okay, I took a screenshot of the, this Redlands map actually from a 2019 town hall meeting video that I found on the Redlands Fire Department. It's not a good photo because it's just a screenshot of a, a video slide, but you can see in this one, now that you're more familiar with the color coding, that Redlands not only has these dark red, very high fire hazard zones, it's also got a lot of the high zone in it too, and the moderate. So you can see by this that the people of Redlands are all concerned or should all be concerned with uh, wildfire in or near their community. Whatever your fire hazard zone, you can get 
very important information from CAL FIRE's website. This is their DSpace or Defensible Space website. And it not only gives us information about Defensible Space, but it help, helps us navigate what is called AB 38. This is a law that went into effect in July 2021 that forces us to be aware of our fire hazards and to be responsible for preparing our property as much as possible for wildfire, both the home itself and the landscaping. And it makes sure that people, buy, people who buy a home on a ridge with a beautiful view know what they're getting into. Okay. When you sell a home in the very high fire hazard area, or also just the high if you're in the state responsibility area, you must have an inspection by a fire agency showing that you're in compliance with the best, best practices of home hardening and defensible space. Um, this defensible space page actually on Cal Fire has a link down here on the left hand side where if you live in their area, you can click this and you can schedule an inspection with Cal Fire. It, those of you that live in the local area will have to contact your local fire agency. But this site is helpful to all of us because as you can see over here on the right side of the screen, you're able to take a defensible based self-assessment. This doesn't go anywhere but for you to see. And it's extremely helpful. It not only gives you some practical looks at defensible space issues, but it lets you know the kind of things that a fire department, including your local one, will be looking for. So it's a good heads up. And also, I suggest that you look at these two uh, other sites for information on AB 38. This, it will um, help you understand this process. Now, um, as more, you need to expect also, I'll put it this way, more changes as all fire agencies throughout the states will be hammering out the details of what they expect people to do, trying to make it safer for everyone, but also doable. The CAL FIRE page, which I've got copied part of it on the left side of the screen here, has a growing list of counties that have detailed defensible space websites. You'll notice that San Bernardino and Riverside County are not on that list. Uh, they're working on it. So um, to me, I don't have a problem because I know I have to go straight to CAL FIRE, but you again need to contact your local fire agency if you're in one of those local um, responsibility very red areas to hear what they have to say. However, don't be surprised if they don't give you definitive answers yet. Although I found that Redlands video from 2012, I went back and looked at it just earlier this week uh, at the Redlands Fire Department website, and I saw they have a Community Risk Reduction Guidelines and Standards page. However, it's blank. It's um, apparently under construction. so. This is kind of a situation you may be faced with. I did also Google uh, California Fire Safe Councils to see the active councils that are in our two counties. San Bernardino has quite a few. They're mostly mountain areas that has um, a different fire regime actually, of course, than the Valley does. And there's two in Riverside County. So these fire safe councils could be a good resource for you. Um, so anyway, now is the time to learn about home hardening and all the defensible landscaping zones that apply to your situation. And also work with your neighbors, talk to them. A lot of us live very close together and what, and you can share your knowledge with them and help them also realize that this is a big issue. And remember what you do will affect the safety of your home, and more importantly, your family. Okay, so now for those other issues that can exacerbate fire hazard, um, your fire hazard. The first one probably is huge, and this is the intensity and timing of wind where you live, particularly the Santa Ana winds that blow in the fall. It's absolutely critical. Fires spread rapidly in windy conditions. They push embers far ahead of the front 
and CAL FIRE aircraft cannot fly in high winds, particularly if the terrain creates its own turbulence, which uh, large fires will, and large fires can create their own wind. And wind direction can change rapidly. So if you live where wind is a common occurrence, or even if you don't, please be aware of these red flag warnings. And if wind is a big issue with you, take them very seriously. Take extreme measures to protect your home, um, but be ready to evacuate in spite of how much you've hardened your home or landscaping. Another issue is what's called aspect. If your home faces south, and the vegetation near you is uh, as flammable looking as the chemise here on this south facing slope. You also need to take um, more desperate measures, not desperate, but more extreme measures to harden your home and modify your landscape as much as possible. So these two pictures, I was walking in the hills above my house and I went down a ravine that I hadn't visited before. So I'm in this ravine where two slopes come together. I look to my left and you, I took a, a picture on my phone of what you see on the left here. And then I look to my right and I saw what you see on the right here on the south facing slope. It looks like I'm not even on the same planet and I hadn't even taken a step. So an ember landing and uh, this chemise on the south facing slope would ignite dry vegetation immediately. I'm not trying to say that chamise is a bad plant because actually it's a wonderful plant. Um, we still have hills in Southern California, mostly because they are binded together by the deep penetrating roots of chamise and chamise will grow and protect the landscape where nothing else will. But if we have placed our homes near of a south facing slope like this, we have to make modifications. Um, one other um, kind of important thing to note is that although homeowners love to view from high slopes and land developers love to provide them for a price, but the top of a hill or a ridge is a dangerous place to live. Fire naturally leans into a slope as it moves uphill, warming the vegetation so that it's primed to explode into fire, into flame. So if this is your situation, your home needs to be hardened as much as possible to prevent ignition. And um, the landscaping needs to be extremely modified, particularly on the slope itself. And especially if you have no setback like the home in this graphic, not a good situation. Uh, in a subdivision, living on a cul-de-sac also presents a problem. And you are automatically in greater hazard if your home abuts uh, vegetation like these orange homes here it's right against the vegetation and you will have more work to do than your the homes in your cul-de-sac that don't directly above abut on vegetation the configuration of a cul-de-sac limits the area in which firefighters have to work and traffic congestion here is in an emergency is almost instantaneous so don't hesitate to leave as soon as a fire approaches certainly when evacuation orders are released. Evacuate long before the firefighters arrive. Their engines and equipment will fill up the entire street area as they battle to save homes. And they often lose precious time evacuating residents that should already be gone. So don't make it any harder for them. That is a problem for firefighters. So this is the UC ANR publication that can give you the information you need to harden your home to ignition and fire. However, it's 20 pages long and it can be very overwhelming. So don't, don't start reading it right away. Scroll down to page 19, keep scrolling, and you'll come to a table 
where they have a summary of the main points. And you'll be able to tell by looking at those main points, things that would apply to your home. So just then go back and look at those. Okay? You'll know what you're, you're going to have to work on. And remember that you do have to start with your home. This is what you're working to protect. Now this, and it better work. Oh, good. Short video, let me stop it for a second. It is working, I'm glad of that. This is a short video from um, Fire Safe Marin County, but it does a super job talking about zone zero, the only zone and defensible landscaping we have time to talk about today, but it's also the zone we all have. And uh, so uh, Katie, tell me if you can't hear it, but hopefully it's gonna work well. Hi, my name is Todd Lando. I'm the coordinator at Fire Safe Marin. Since 2017, wildfires have destroyed more than 30,000 homes in California. To protect our families and communities, we need to learn how structures ignite during wildfires and take action to protect our own homes. It's not uncommon for a home to be completely destroyed while the surrounding vegetation, particularly mature trees, is untouched by the fire. This is because the home itself and the immediate area around the home is most vulnerable to falling embers, which can be carried by wind far ahead of the fire. The concept of defensible space is not new. It's been required by law in Marin since the 1930s. You may have received a notice in the past from your local fire department asking you to cut the grass or trim the trees around your home. Even if you didn't receive a notice, you're still required to do this routine maintenance. This is defensible space. When we think of defensible space, it's helpful to imagine different zones, depending on the distance from the building we want to protect. More intensive maintenance and greater attention to detail is required the closer you are to the home. Today, we're only going to talk about the most important of the defensible space zones. This is the area closest to your house, within five feet of any part of a building, including the decks or anything attached to the home. This is the area that is most vulnerable to igniting from embers during a wildfire and should be more aggressively maintained for fire resistance. We call this zone zero. Zero means zero combustibles. Nothing that can ignite from embers should be placed, planted, or allowed to accumulate here. This is ground zero for igniting homes during a wildfire. To create an effective zone zero, you need to understand how homes actually ignite during wildfires. Studies have shown that 60 to 90 percent of homes destroyed in wildfires are ignited by tiny embers, not the flames of the fire itself. These embers can be carried by wind for miles in front of the fire, and they'll ignite any combustible surface or material they land on. Laboratory research has helped us engineer better materials and building features to protect homes from wildfires and embers. Many of these features have been incorporated into California's building codes, especially Chapter 7A, the Wildland Urban Interface Code. The same research has helped identify specific measures a homeowner can take in Zone Zero. Building codes only help when a new home is built or an existing home is remodeled. But the work you do in Zone Zero can be undertaken at any time. Fortunately, many of the things you can do to protect your home and property against embers are simple and inexpensive, or even free. Some are more complex and might require upgrades or changes to your home. We know that during wildfires, embers tend to collect near the base of a home's exterior walls and will ignite anything there that burns. This is the first place you should look to determine how vulnerable your home is. Do you have wood siding that extends within six inches of the ground? Do you have bark mulch? plants or a buildup of leaves in this area? Even some homes that look fire hardened might be vulnerable here. Is the wood sheathing beneath your home's stucco walls exposed, leaving an opening where flames and embers can ignite the home from inside the walls? To protect this vulnerable area near the base of your exterior walls, we recommend removing anything that can catch fire or burn, especially wood chips, bark mulch, fallen leaves and needles, and even most plants. If you're a gardener, you know that mulch plays an important role in your landscape. Mulches hold moisture in the ground and when used correctly can provide nutrients and keep your plants healthier. A good thing from a fire perspective. 
Unfortunately, wood or bark mulch in zone zero can be one of your home's biggest vulnerabilities. Despite the positive attributes, many common mulches are combustible, a major drawback when your home is located in a wildfire prone area. Within five feet of any part of your home, you should choose inorganic mulches like gravel or stone instead of wood or bark. Hardscape pathways of decomposed granite, cobblestone pavers, or concrete are great choices too. These materials offer superior ember resistance and can stop a creeping fire from reaching your home. Even if you've chosen rock or gravel, you still need to clean this area regularly. Any windblown leaf litter or debris that collects in Zone Zero is vulnerable to igniting from embers. Protecting Zone Zero also means moving any common items you might have stored there, like wood piles, firewood, lumber, or even patio furniture and garbage and recycling cans. Never store anything combustible under decks or porches or overhangs. We know it's a convenient place to store or hide materials, but this is a recipe for disaster. Keep these areas spotlessly clean year-round. Consider screening or enclosing the underside of decks to protect from embers and help you resist the temptation to store things there. When outdoor furniture and decorations are placed near a structure or on a deck, porch, or patio, there's a risk that they'll act as kindling and ignite your home during a wildfire. Wood or plastic patio furniture, natural fiber doormats, shades, screens, umbrellas, and curtains can all ignite easily from embers. Evidence exists that many otherwise ignition-resistant homes have burned because of the homeowner's choice of accessories. Choose outdoor accessories made from non-combustible or ignition-resistant material. A heavy rubber doormat or a decorative metal grate is a better choice than a natural fiber doormat. Cast aluminum furniture is better than wicker or hardwood. Take advantage of time at home and nice weather to get out in the yard today and focus on removing dead plant material, starting in zone zero closest to the home. Remove dead shrubs and trees, fallen leaves and needles, dry grass and weeds, fallen twigs and branches. Pay closest attention to zone zero, but remember that winds can quickly blow debris back towards your house if you don't keep your entire yard clean. When creating your home's defensible space, zone zero is ground zero, the most important place and the place you should start. But don't ignore the other zones. Your next steps will focus on zone one from five to 30 feet and zone two up to 100 feet from your home. Check out our other videos or visit www.firesafemarin.org to learn more. Just a lot of interesting things in this um, in this video, but I want to revisit this particular frame about mulching uh, just for a moment because mulching, mulching and defensible space landscaping is um, is a big issue and difficult for a lot of people. So remember that zone zero, the first five feet, only inorganic mulch, gravel, stones, rocks, hardscaping. You can even have some bare soil there. It's it's good for native bees, many of which are solitary ground dwellers. But when you move into the next zone, zone one, you can use this medium or larger size bark or wood chips. However, I know we're not going to talk about zone one, but I do want to mention it when when you are in zone one that up to 30 feet from your home and you're using wood uh, mulching like this, you it cannot be continuous. You want to break it up somewhat either with paths or whatever however you want to do it so there's not a continuous horizontal avenue in which for uh, fire to travel and the other big thing is some of you if you do use the native plant in your home landscaping a lot of home native plant landscapers love to use shredded bark this is called gorilla hair here this is not allowed in Marin County because they consider it too flammable, way too flammable, although there are native plant landscapers that swear by it, but just be aware of that. And no recycled rubber because it's highly flammable. 
So other requirement in zone zero can be um, difficult for us, particularly if we have traditional landscaping that has shrubs or hedges up against uh, the house. And so this slide just is kind of a, a summary of what we heard on the video. And one thing I want to mention too, when it talks about clean old fallen leaves, needles regularly, Remember too, it's all about dead or dying stuff. So look through, think about this, not only for zone zero, but for zone one in your house, is if you move further out, you wanna clear dead stuff, you know, look through your plants. You'll be surprised how much when you move the green leaves aside on the top, what you see inside there. Um, something else about this, I do wanna mention that local agencies such as Marin County, which does have some definite requirements that other places may not have. They, a lot of local agencies will have additional requirements. And one I'm seeing more often is um, places that are banning the use of artificial turf, which does not break my heart. I think that's a good thing. But their reason is, is that it absorbs heat rapidly and is very combustible. So how you decide to implement this GEVO combustible zone zero, as well as the best practices of zone one, which many of you will have, and some will also have a zone two, it depends upon your level of risk and what you're willing to do to alleviate it. So I'd like you to look at this graphic just for a second, and you see that the eaves on this um, house and garage are enclosed. And that's a great home hardening design, those closed eaves. So I'm gonna show you my house. I not only have open eaves, as you can see here, big open eaves, but the two before supporting them extend even further beyond, altogether this is at least 18 inches, another uh, foot and a half beyond the, the pad of the veranda. So um, so not only do I have open eaves, I have a covered veranda, both of them, which are bad design elements in a home in a high, very high fire hazard district. This home was built in 2003. Um, and although it has many good qualities, actually, it has only wood or metal fences, all these, these houses, no wood fences. Um, the venting of the house is great. There's not that many avenues for uh, uh, embers to enter into the house through the attic, but this is this part is not good. So I realize now that I really need to start my zone zero, not at the edge of the veranda, but at the trip line of these open eaves. So that's, and we're working on it this winter. So my zone zero from, that veranda is gonna reach seven feet out instead of five. And still, I'm not sure if, um, if that's enough. Uh, the wind does not blow here very early. I'm not at the top of the slope. I'm not directly against um, wildland vegetation, but we're still considering boxing these eaves, which will, would be expensive. So we're still thinking about that. So, one thing I do want to say, and I really wish we had more time to talk about it, but I want you to know that extensive well-watered lawns, you probably know that, uh, were once a poster child for defensible landscaping, but that's changing. They're not really ecologically helpful, and the water required for them is astronomical. So. And we know that landscaping water for uh, in the future is going to be increasingly limited in California. California, and now people are starting to look at California natives and realizing that we had a good, huge palette of good choices that will fit defensible scaping, landscaping um, uh, requirements that we've been missing for a long time. So we're starting to look at these. Natives have adaptations to limited water availability 
uh, in our Mediterranean climate because they evolved with that climate and that soil. So they, they've evolved ways to stay hydrated better than exotic, uh, those ex exotics from other uh, areas. Uh, and what did I want to say? Oh yeah, okay. And many are very adaptable to, um, to defensible landscaping. It depends on how you maintain them. It, pretend, it depends on the particular plants you choose. But you can have a water efficient habitat garden with all the other benefits of native landscaping, including creating some, trying to make up for some of all the native landscaping that we've been destroying madly for 150 years or longer now. So do think about these choices. And we can still do it while adhering to state and, and local uh, fire codes. So this is from Theodore Payne, a native plant grower, and they have a whole section, and it's gonna be on your um, resources about rethinking resilience to wildfire with uh, native landscape, uh, native plants. Also, this past fall, I completed a 24 hours uh, symposium presented by the Association of professional landscape designers. And if you'll see down here, this was, it was all about creating beautiful native landscapings, landscapes in the face of water scarcity and fire. I am no more a landscape designer than I am a fire professional, but it was very invigorating to hear the exchange of ideas from those who are committed to using California, California natives as a landscaping response to limited water and fire threat. There were over a hundred professional landscapers in this class and plus a few, um, there were fire professionals, um, native plant growers, and a few oddballs like me who paid for it, okay? So this too is a work in progress, but I'm very excited that we can be part of it, that CNS can be part of it, and all of you and all other home landscapers in California can be part of this. So the last thing and probably most important we need to talk about um, evacuation. Okay, this is the coffee neighborhood in Santa Rosa. This is what it looked like on October 8th, 2000, 2017. Oops, I misplaced something just a second here. I put it where it shouldn't be. I wonder what I did with it. Oops, just a second. I'm losing my drama here because I'm not paying attention. Oh my gosh. Okay, so anyway. This is the morning of April 8th, 2017. This is what it looked like the next morning, October the 9th. Now, um, total devastation. Okay. The fire was ignited by an electrical malfunction in a home 12 miles north of this neighborhood the evening before. Embers were driven by fierce winds reaching this and it reached this community at three o'clock in the morning. These people were awaked with emergency sirens and personnel going through the neighborhood. They grabbed their sleeping children and they ran. This was the worst case scenario. These people were lucky to escape with their lives and some of them didn't. The CAL FIRE website has a lot of information about preparing for wildfire and evacuation. You can see that I skipped all the first steps, the first, the three first steps, and went directly to a go evacuation guide that we're going to look at. We're going to do this exercise as if you had to evacuate tonight without much preparation, as many Californians have done. So you should have in your handout a list of pre-evacuation pre preparation steps, even though it's way down the list of your preparation here. And we're gonna look at this, this little graphic as we just quickly go over them. So first, number one, here's the one right in the middle of the house. Gather up flammable items, although it says from the exterior of the house and bring them inside. 
patio furniture, children's toys, doormats, trash cans, etc., or place them in your pool. You can also put stuff in your garage, but like this house has an attached garage. It's well within the, the zone zero. But keep in mind, you've got a lot of flammable things in your garage, um, but you can put it in there too. Number two, if you have a propane tank, turn it off. Number three, move propane barbecue appliances away from structures. Number four, attach garden hoses to outside water valves to use for use by firefighters. Fill water buckets, put them around the house. Number five, don't leave sprinklers on or water running. It can affect critical water pressure. If you have a well-maintained and adequately hydrated hydrated to fix the landscaping, you're good to go anyway. And this is not really going to help. You know, when a fire comes through, all that water is going to evaporate quickly and it will be wasted. Number six, leave the exterior lights on on your house so that the house will be visible to firefighters if it's smoky or if it's night. So the lights on. Number seven, put emergency kits in your car if you prepare them. Number eight, back your car into the driveway with the vehicle loaded and all doors and windows closed. Keep your car keys with you. You know, this number eight um, follows me a little bit. I'm, I'm thinking about our kids. Should our children be in that car too? I think they should. And anyone in your home with limited um, mobility should be in that car. If it's too hot, hot and stuffy in the car with the windows rolled up, I think the time to go would be right now and don't worry about the rest of this. But, you know, I just thought they never mentioned kids. Okay. Number nine. Okay, there's number nine. Okay, the ladder. You should uh, keep a ladder handy and place it at the corner of your house so firefighters can access your roof. Okay. Seal the attic and route bins with pre-cut plywood uh, or commercial seals. Can you imagine climbing into the attic? Um, I've already covered mine with um, not, not a solid um, protection, but with two layers of eight inch square wire, hardscape wire. Beekeepers use it. It would be good if you even had one sixteenth inch, but I just use two layers of eight inch opening wire and kind of offset them a little bit. So they're already on the, the vents in the attic. Number 11 at the top here, monitor your property and the fire situation. Don't wait for an evacuation order if you feel threatened and need to leave. One thing that the Redlands Fire Department mentioned was that they felt that people looked too much to their phone for someone to tell them to leave when they could look around and see they should have left already. So I thought that was a kind of a good point. Uh, number 12, check on neighbors and make sure that they are preparing to leave. Um, elderly folks and anyone with mobility issues, and this includes not having a vehicle available, which is more common than us relatively affluent people realize is at very high risk in fire emergencies. Number 13, shut all the windows but and doors to the house, but leave them unlocked, all unlocked. Number 14, remove any flammable window shades or covers. Um, you could dump them on the bed here. If you have installed metal shutters, um, close those. Number 15, here with this couch. Move flammable furniture to the center of rooms away from windows and doors, but leave a path for firefighters to make their way to your home. Number 16, turn off the gas meter. Turn off any pilot lights you might have if you have a gas stove that still uses a pilot light or perhaps a, a water heater. Number 17, here for the whole house. Leave your interior lights on everywhere in your house. The bigger beacon you can make in the middle of the night if firefighters need to see your house. Leave all the interior lights on, okay? It could be very smoky during the day too, but 
that will make a beacon that will get their attention. 18, shut off the air conditioning. And of course, if you have a whole house fan, that shut off or any ceiling fans that you have in the house, they all should be cut off. And then 19, locate your pets and keep them nearby. And 20, prepare, is that a horse here or a pony? Prepare farm animals for transport and think about leaving them at a safe location early. Those of you with large animals must be laughing at how likely they say prepare farm animals for transport. This is a huge issue if you have them and those of you that have them know it. We have friends with three horses. They had moved them to a location they had long before arranged in case of emergency. And that happened to them in the El Dorado fire. So they moved their three horses. However, they then had to find another place because that fire grew and grew and approached the wildland edge of Beaumont where their horses were at. And also they have two adopted donkeys that are really quite wild. They had to open the gates and just let them find their own safety as they're almost impossible to trailer. Now they put food in the trailer so the little the donkeys have to go in there and eat, hoping it'll be easier the next time they have to evacuate. They left their three dogs with us, but then we had to evacuate, so that was a lot of dogs. So another point I want to make, leave your gates unlocked and open, especially if you have wooden gates that are attached to the house. That gate can be the avenue that brings fire into your home. And I know it's hard to leave your home um, seeming so, un so vulnerable with all the lights on inside and out and all the doors unlocked, okay? But get used to that idea now so it won't be so difficult in the future. Okay. And of course, you have to think about the others that you care about. My son in Anaheim Hills does not live in a fire hazard zone. But he came home when the fire started in Chino Hills to pick up his son, who was 18 months old at the time, and at his babysitter, babysitter's house two miles from his home. Just a precaution, you know. I was pretty terrified several months later when I picked up my little grandson and saw how close the fire perimeter had come to his babysitter's home. It still, it bothers me to think about that. But these... There's a lot of issues to consider when you're making evacuation plans. And, and so please look at the CAL FIRE website. Um, it'll tell you, it'll help you think about the things you need to know. Okay, so now it's a couple of minutes to look at the resources page. Um, the first part of it has CAL FIRE websites. Okay, the, the Severity Zone Viewer from 2007 is here and also the new state park of 2022, if you need to, to look at that. And of course, all that information on their Defensible Space web, web, website about AB 38 home inspections, the, the uh, self-inspection you can do. And then the last part to prepare, to be ready for wildfire and particularly all the things you should be thinking about to prepare for evacuation. And then I've added that UCR, um, UC, excuse me, UC A and R publication 8395 that tells that 20 page thing that tells you about home hardening. So you can take a look at that. Remember, scroll down to page 19 first, okay? And then um, the latest UC A and R publication on defensible landscaping. So vegetation and landscape guidance. This one came out in 2020 or 21, and it was the first one that had zone zero on it. I think it's 2021. Okay, so the most up up to date information on um, defensible space. And then lastly, fire resilient landscaping with California natives. There's a theo There's more than this, but Theodore Payne has thought some things you can look at it right now, including talking about what kind of native plants that you might put in your landscaping and how they could work for you. And, and also this website, Sustainable Defensible Space, which actually I linked through Theodore Payne. 
eco-appropriate homescaping for wildfire resilience. All about using native plants and about maintenance, 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 so important. And then Erin uh, Eccles, which, who is a, a CNS, uh, a CNPS member from our chapter. He's a restoration uh, ecologist at the Inland Empire Resource Conference um, Con Conservation District. He has started um, his own tentative of plantless, look like other plant growers are doing now, including um, Tree of Life, Mike Evans at Tree of Life, looking at plants that they think would be easiest for people to use and, and, a, and most appropriate and different fire hazard zones. So if you'd like a, a look at Aaron's list, it's developed for San Bernardino County, mountains um, and valley areas, but applicable to Riverside County too. He, he gave me permission to send it to you. So there it is, we're done. Are there any questions? I'm gonna quit, I'm gonna stop sharing here. Great, thanks very much, Becky. And if you have questions, you can put those in the chat, or excuse me, in the Q&A, and Becky can answer your questions. And just want to also note um, in the chat, there is a link to the two resource documents that Becky just referred to. Um, really super um, helpful, Becky, to put those together. Thank you very much for that. Those are also available on our CNPS website, <clears throat> Riverside. Riverside San Bernardino CNPS.org. So, um, see if we have any questions. Here's a question in the chat from Arlie. Becky, do you have some main recommendations about plant trimming and maintenance near homes? Oh, yeah. Um, in that zone zero, zone zero, you shouldn't have many plants, okay? And zone one, um, be very careful with mulch. You can use it and you will want to use it. Otherwise, you'll have a gillion weeds. But do not make it continuous. Uh, be careful with ground covers. If you lift up the top of ground covers, even people that use ice plant and they think that's good, there's so much dead thatch underneath and you need to clean that out. So be careful with ground covers. You can use them, but you will have to keep them trimmed and you'll have to look underneath and clear out the dead stuff that accumulates on them. And look under your other plants too. It's easiest probably to use herbaceous plants that are low growing and level one because they don't grow woody parts. You can have plants that have woody parts. There's some low growing um, manzanitas and cyanothus, uh, but keep them, try to lift them a little off the ground, start training them when they're small. Cyanothus doesn't really like to be trimmed very much. They're more um, temperamental. Sages will take it. Um, the uh, manzanitas, Arctostophilo species, there's a lot of those, they tend to have a more open growth habit. So they're, uh, you know, and they will grow well in our area. Uh, you can use wild wildflowers and actually I grow them and they're, you know, they're coming up now and I have them for the spring and I let them last as long as I can, but as we, enter to the drier period. I let them go to seed, I spread the seed, but then I clean all that out again. So you just, the cleaning and the maintenance is very important, so important. But you'll see that when you look at those, um, those uh, defensive landscaping handouts, especially that last one from, from uh, UCA and R. We'll tell you about that too. So that's okay. pretty much it. I hope you're not all so overwhelmed. <laughs> if you do have questions, um, I think my email is in uh, in the chat too. 
you, you guys that are here today, you can email me and, and we can talk about it. Or if you want more sources or have specific questions like Arlie's about landscaping, I can, that one um, link, sustainable, that one I had on the uh, resources, the second one after Theodore Payne, they talk about, um, they talk about maintenance. Um, one thing I want you to not worry about, I, I know a lot of people like to do maintenance at a certain time, but if you're out there looking around and you see you've got some plants that you're worried about, just thin them out, lift them up, cut them off. If they die, plant another one, but it's not likely to, unless maybe it's to see an old, they're picky about that. So you might have to work with them from their babies as they grow to keep them lifted up a little bit and cleaned out. Okay. Great. Thanks, Becky. That was a super presentation and really informative. Um, this presentation was recorded and it will be posted. So if you'd like to refer to the information that Becky provided, that'll be posted on our website and also on our Facebook page, probably by Monday. It takes a little while for it to download. So if you want to check for it, the recording will be available. Okay. I saw a question about yep. the the wire for covering vents in the attic somebody um I, I want to tell you this this was just something that i thought of there was a recommendation at one time in hardscaping that you know you cover vents in the attic with wire and first it was quarter inch and then it was one eighth inch and then it got down to 16th of an inch opening you know tiny opening and it can't just be a aluminum screen it's got to be like hardware cloth. And what I found was that beekeepers use one, you can get one eighth inch opening hardwire cloth that would not melt or burn or any of that, but it's still pretty big. So um, I measured, I have two vents that in the attic and I measured them and cut actually four pieces of that wire and I just went up there and with a um, staple gun and covered the entire wood framing uh, of that vent with the first layer of that one eighth inch um, hardware card, a hard hardware cloth. And I just ordered it online from some beekeeper place. I can't remember what, that's where I found it. It's kind of, sometimes it's hard to find. And then I put up the second layer and just offset it a little bit to make those openings smaller. And I did the same thing on the other one. And that's how it is now. Um, I don't have any, I don't use anything but that. I hope it's enough. So that's how I did it. So I don't see anything else. Any other questions? Uh, there's a question in the chat from LJ who asks if you should put in your hardware cloth now or wait until and mesh now or wait until the fire is happening. No, do it now. You don't want to be. Um, yeah, yeah. You don't want to be climbing up in the attic when you've got the kids running around and you're trying to put the ladder up and all that kind of stuff and and hoping that you know, you're always worried about your landscaping. Did you do enough? You know, you can't, you don't want to have to focus on that when you're about ready to leave. I think they just put that there because there were some things that they want you to think about and hoping you'll go back and look at the beginning steps that where they talk about stuff like that. So now's a good time this afternoon <laughs> or whenever you get your wire. So oh, lots of comments. Thank you for the presentation, Becky. Um, tremendous presentation. Lots of folks are just appreciating. So, okay. Thanks everybody for joining us yes. and um, look forward to our program in February. Okay. Thank you so much for thanks coming. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye bye. Yeah.